Hello, my name is Andrew Gary and welcome to Seismic Sound Off, in-depth conversations in applied geophysics. I am joined by Dr. Vladimir Gretchka and Dr. Werner M. Heigl to discuss their new book, Microseismic Monitoring. Visit seg.org slash new books to learn more. Vladimir has his MS in geophysical exploration and a PhD in geophysics. He has worked as a research scientist, an associate research professor, and for major oil and gas companies. Since 2012, he is a senior technical consultant at Marathon Oil Company, focusing on reservoir characterization with seismic, microseismic, and borehole data. He received the J. Clarence Carter Award in 1997 and the Best Paper in the Leading Edge Award in 2013. Werner received his Ph.D. in geophysics in 2011 and has a long history working in the field. He joined Apache's EMP Technology Group in 2006 as a senior geophysicist. Since 2008, Werner has been involved in designing, recording, and processing of nearly all microseismic data sets acquired by Apache. In 2011, he launched the Microseismic Special Interest Group in Houston, now managed by the Geophysical Society of Houston. Vladimir starts our discussion next. So to start with, what is your 60-second summary of microseismic monitoring? Our book is written for geophysicists who practice microseismic and would like to bring their practice to a higher level. The key ingredient in microseismic data processing is a velocity model in which locations of microseismic events and their moment tensors are computed. Our book acknowledges seismic anisotropy as a critical part of velocity models constructed for unconventional shale reservoirs and provides the methodology for anisotropy estimation from typical microseismic data. Anything to add, Werner? You know, in, in addition to what Vladimir had said, I think the book also tried to uh, capture a little bit both of our experience uh, over the years. And uh, what we have observed ourselves, uh, having been involved in, in numerous of these uh, uh, microseismic experiments, and uh, and so we try to incorporate that and uh, and uh, add a little bit sort of the the practical side and 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 uh, and highlight a little bit the practical issues that, that one faces. And then you will see, for example, in the book, uh, there's lots of um, plots and figures in there that show raw data, and uh, and and we have deliberately uh, not done a lot of cleaning and editing and filtering uh, to the data because that's what reality is. Uh, you deal uh, in, and, you, and we're going to come to this later when you're, when you're going to ask us about what the difference between global seismology and microseismic monitoring is. And one of the big differences is, is essentially uh, that our data is generally of very low signal to noise ratio and very noisy in general and, uh, and sort of has, has challenges. And, uh, and it was one of the uh, things that I personally wanted to get across. And um, and as Vladimir has uh, um, already stated, uh, applying the theory to, to, to noisy data is, is, uh, is challenging. So the, and the book tried to basically um, uh, explain on, on, on how, you, how you go about it. Um, and not just some, some in, a, in a simple way, but rather in a way that would allow you to get really good results if you, if you follow what, uh, what we have in the book. This is a very good point, Werner, because, because I am already getting questions to some of our figures, which is pretty cool. <laughs> how how do you choose how did in the book did you choose to define microseismic it's kind of a bit of a, a term that that at least in our industry has established itself i would say over the last uh, you know decade or so and uh, and when you when you when you look at chapter one um the very first paragraph i tried to sort of Historically, capture how the term has been used, and and uh, and as you can see, uh, we went from um, micro size mims, which was the very first term that people coined up uh, just to to make to distinguish these these acoustic emissions that happen when rocks crack from the uh, the term micro seism that was that's been used in uh, among seismologists, and what they simply refer to is a sort of just general background noise. Um, and, and, and in global seismology, this, this general background noise is often caused by, uh, simply by, by ocean waves hitting on, on the coastline of, 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 of continents, right? And, uh, and they have another term. They use uh, micro-earthquakes for, for earthquakes that, have, that basically are generated by not necessarily rock breaking, but by, by, by small faults essentially slipping. And, um, and they have sort of a cut of magnitude. They call everything that's less than magnitude three uh, they call this a micro earthquake, 
in our situation, in uh, uh, when we when we monitor hydraulic fracture treatments in, in unconventional reservoirs, the reservoir just cracks because you you pump a lot of fluid into it under high pressure, and and, and the rock just gets strained, and, and eventually it reaches a, a point where 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 this strain is released, and uh, and this energy shows up in the form of uh, of elastic waves, and uh, and we call this micro seismic waves or micro seismic event, and, and therefore micro seismic monitoring. I don't think uh, anyone uses these old terms anymore. Uh, you will find the term micro earthquake uh, being used and micro seismic in, 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 in global seismology, but as I said, it has a slightly different meaning. In our case, micro seismic means uh, you know, elastic waves generated by rocks cracking, while in, uh, on the global seismology, micro seismic is just a general background noise that's caused mostly by either cultural background noise or old, you know, uh, uh, cars or trucks driving on the road, just human activity and, and, and predominantly, especially at the lower frequency uh, uh, end of the spectrum, is just these ocean, these waves hitting uh, hitting the coastline, the beaches in California and on the, on the East Coast and around the world and, and just constantly keep uh, the continents basically vibrating and uh, and, and so that is, uh, as, far, as far as I understand <clears throat> what uh, seismologists would understand uh, under the term seismic. Speaking of chapter one, you, you write in there that the basic principles of micro seismic monitoring had been established by the early 70s. Why do you think the level of scholarship for text now, including your books, your book has been so minimal? That's a very good question. Um, and uh, this was sort of, uh, for me, I, uh, really the biggest learning lesson while I worked on this, on the introduction, people had recognized, I mean, people in generally were smart. And especially when you're in a situation uh, where you don't have all the technology available that we have available now, very limited measurements uh, in terms of number and in terms of quality, but a generally good understanding of the involved physics. And, <clears throat> and so people had to be really ingenious to extract uh, information uh, in, in, in such circumstances. And, and I think a holdup for why micro seismic hasn't really developed faster since, let's say, the early 70s or so, I think is really exactly that. The, the technology just to wasn't there to uh, foster further development. This is, I mean, you can observe this in, 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 in physics and you can observe this in, uh, in, uh, in electronics. It's a, it's a similar phenomenon. People at some point uh, have accumulated enough data that sort of have a good, a good intuitive understanding of, of, of the problems of, of the current situation. But to make a step forward would require, or almost always requires, measure, more measurements and, and measurements with a, with, a, with a better resolution and with a, with a better precision. And, uh, and I think this was the, the, the main reason why uh, it, uh, development kind of stalled since the early 70s, uh, 70s right? And uh, the other thing I think that, that hurts us a little bit in our industry, at least, is the fact that, uh, that many of the uh, big oil companies uh, decided over the last, I should say, maybe 15, 20 years or so to uh, either abandon their research departments or, or significantly reduce their, their size and their, and their funding. And, uh, and, and therefore, a lot of this research nowadays happens at universities, but the academic uh, environment is very different. There's very different objectives and, uh, and requirements and, uh, and, and things that uh, university professors and their, and their students have to, have to adhere to. And so you see a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, papers and abstracts being published, but a lot of this, I can tell you, is, is interesting, uh, but may not have an immediate use uh, in the industry. And so we're kind of sort of in the situation now where Technology is there to get better measurements, uh, and we also can acquire measurements in large numbers. But the uh, what to do with it now um, it just kind of lacks a little bit uh, uh, because of that. And and, you, and, uh, and I guess Vladimir, you can you can perhaps elaborate on that. I mean, you and I were in, in similar situations where, and in, in you in a marathon, and I formerly at, at Apache. Oftentimes, uh, micro, the micro seismic expertise ends up being a one a one man show. And you have limited resources, limited funding, and there's only so much you can do, right? Yes, and I think I think this is pretty much the case now in uh, many companies, in the majority of companies, uh, that the, they have one so-called expert who is doing pretty much everything, and it is very seldom when when there are several people doing micro seismic in a given company, although the, there are a few exceptions, but but typically it is a one man show. I think I think uh, to add to what Werner just said, why micro seismic activity took off in the past say ten years or so from the level uh, that it was in the early two thousand. I think it is because 
hydraulic fracturing provided almost tailor-made application for microseismic. We are doing it simply because engineers, our engineers at oil companies want to know what they're fracking. They want to know where their fractures are in the reservoirs. And, and this, is, this is the primary, primary driver, I would say, for, do, for uh, acquiring all those microseismic data. And I think if uh, that would not be the case, the industry would not acquire hundreds and hundreds of surveys that we have now. What motivated the two of you to write this book? So we decided about two years ago, maybe a little, little more than two, over two and a half years ago, to do this. And I think we both were at a, at, a, at a point where we had seen enough data, had learned enough, and, uh, and it just, I think, seemed to be a good idea, at least for me, to put uh, knowledge and experience to paper and, uh, and, and make that available you know, for, for other people. And, uh, and, uh, and there was, there's nothing comparable out there uh, at the moment. Uh, we know of, or I'm aware of, of uh, one other book that's in the works. Professor David Eaton from the University of Calgary is working on one. Yeah, it has, as far as we know, it has a sort of a slightly, slightly different outlook uh, th than ours. Um, if somebody really wanted to acquire microseismic data and um, wanted to understand what he needs to know and what he needs to do to get to a good result and, uh, and also how to do it, then uh, there was just nothing out there. You would, you would literally be required to uh, you know, sort of do a little bit what I, what I did for, the, for my research for the introduction you know, figure out what have people done in the past and uh, what problems have they encountered, what solution have they come up with, and, uh, and then study more or less the global seismology textbooks and then somehow fit this into a, a framework that is applicable to uh, the oil field. And, uh, and so I think our book should, uh, should help in that. So the, at least this was my, 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 my motivation at the time to, to really make this effort and, uh, and put it to paper just to, you know, capture what is necessary and add what we have learned and experienced and, uh, and, and you know, make it available for other people. Yeah, for, for me, it was uh, also the desire to share my best practices with, uh, with geophysicists, primarily from service companies. In, in essence, I wanted to help my colleagues and through them help the microseismic projects that I am constantly running. So time and time again, I see microseismic service companies struggling with the uh, velocity model building. And ju just to give you a quick example, uh, Werner and I were partners on a downhole microseismic project run by a major microseismic service company that just postulated at a certain point that a four millisecond misfit between the travel time that they picked from data and travel time predicted by their best model. So that misfit of four milliseconds was good and they postulated it simply because they could not make it any smaller. And on the other hand, I know that the, te the techniques we discuss, discuss in the, we, uh, dis uh, discuss in the book consistently deliver misfits about one millisecond. So it is fourfold improvement on what uh, the industry is doing. And um, uh, this repeats itself over and over again. And I find myself in the situation that, okay, I get those deliverables and now I have to do additional work to improve them. For me, much better world would be if the service companies do that. And I just look at it and it is good and, and move on. In each chapter, you all include something new. It's ideas, results, data. For each of you, what was your favorite new discovery made in writing the book? So for me, it was most definitely appendix to C. It contains algebraic equations that describe a general group velocity surface. I derived those equations in the fall of 2014, that is a few months before we began working on the book. Uh, when I started solving those equations, I discovered to my surprise, I was surprised uh, at first, that their numerically computed degree was always 43 regardless of what I did to my quick of how I solved them and for many, many, many models that, that I tested. 
And that was extremely puzzling for me. So why 43? It seemed to be such an arbitrary number. So I kept thinking and thinking about it and kept rewriting and rewriting the appendix until everything became absolutely clear. So now, three years down the road, I can explain very, in very simple terms to anyone why the degree of equations representing group velocity surfaces in generally anisotropic media should be 43. That result has acquired now the status of mathematical certainty. So this was very satisfactory for me. So my, my biggest um, uh, surprise was the fact that sort of the, the, the fundamental principles of, of the, of the microseismic monitoring method, people had under, worked that out and understood this decades ago. Yeah. And then, of course, the, 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 once those, those fundamentals were, were sort of understood and uh, not all fully developed, but at least understood, the development continues. Yeah, you had then the Rocky Mountain Arsenal, a uh, similar situation uh, where you injected uh, waste fluid and... Um, and then the next big push for the for the technology came when uh, it was decided uh, late 60s, I guess, uh, by politicians, and then put in practice early 70s and 80s and early 90s uh, to pursue um, whether it will be viable to extract geothermal energy. And there, the principle is again very similar. You um, need to somehow to, so, so to to get geothermal energy out of the ground. You need to pump water in, let the water warm up, and then uh, bring it back up to the surface and uh, extract the heat and pump the, cold, the cooler water down again and let it heat up again. So you need to drill a well, uh, an injector well, and a producer well. And, uh, and in between, uh, you, you, you need to create fractures because obviously the water has to, go, has to penetrate the rock and it has to absorb the heat energy and uh, you have to extract it some other point. Uh, so you need to crack up the rock and of, of course you want to know where those cracks are. And so the way that, and this, this one uh, by now probably uh, famous experiment uh, that was done by Los Alamos uh, Laboratory uh, in New Mexico, they drilled a well into a uh, shallow granite and, uh, and then fracked it. And then uh, they, need, they monitored micro seismically because they needed to know where those fractures are in order to place uh, the producer well properly, right? And, uh, and, so, and in that process, the additional challenge was the much higher temperatures that sensors were and, and drilling equipment and drilling fluid was exposed to than what we face uh, in unconventional reservoirs. So that, that again posed extra challenges and, uh, and extra technology had to be developed in the process and yeah, so for me, this was really uh, very um, interesting uh, to see that uh, the technology that we use in the oil field was mostly developed outside the oil field. What are some of the obstacles in transferring seismological methods to microseismic? Uh, I think the, the main um, difficult is in the difference in uh, data recording geometries. You know, in global seismology, we have seismometers all around the globe, and essentially, you you cover the the entire focal sphere of earthquake. In microseismic, we don't have that, but in the way, in a way, geophysicists in microseismic industry are tasked to do the same work as seismologists. Seismologists, but we often have to work much faster. Specifically, I'm referring to real-time processing of microseismic data. Then we have to do the same things or similar things in sparser and, and less favorable geometries than seismologists have. And also, in the presence of significant elastic anisotropy of our reservoirs that needs to be estimated for, for every single survey, so this complex of differences makes many techniques developed in the global seismology hardly applicable for us. We, we essentially need either tailor what is available to our needs or develop something new. What is promising about the area of reservoir imaging? I think it is primarily the potential resolution that those images um, can be, uh, that those images can have. It is um, uh, very high because microseismic data have frequencies of hundreds of hertz, making resolution of a few meters quite attainable. No other seismic technology today comes even remotely close to that, although there is a lot of research going on in improving the resolution. 
And so if the reservoir images can be reliably constructed at such a resolution, granted it is a big if at the moment, but if geophysicists can do that, we are going to see features in our reservoirs that no one dreamed of seeing just a few years ago. So it's going to be a completely new area where many, many, I would say, conventional geophysical techniques like just imaging can be employed. So I, I am pretty excited about it. Yeah, um, I'd like to add to that. When you, when you record the, the seismic waves that are generated when, when rocks crack, and so with sophisticated methods that we describe in the book, and with, uh, with sufficient care and, and, and caution, you can work out an approximate location of where that micro seismic event has occurred. But as uh, Vladimir said, the, the uh, error bars associated with that locations are probably, I would say, uh, at least in the tens of the feet it, it, with a good velocity model and uh, with a not so good velocity model, probably up into the 100 feet or so or more. And so, and plus you get information from a point and that point is relatively uncertain. So it is very difficult, uh, not just for us geophysicists, but, but even more so for, for engineers and geologists that have to deal with this kind of data, how to interpret now these, the micro seismic event cloud. Um, in some situations, there's some uh, unconventional reservoirs, and there tend to be those uh, where you have a little bit of tectonic stress. These, these event clouds tend to align in a certain direction, and, uh, and, and there the interpretation is perhaps a bit easier. And by interpretation, I mean, so how long is this frac that, we have, that was created, and how high, and uh, potentially how wide, and uh, how many frac stages do I need on the horizontal, and, and, and all of that. But in general, it is very hard. Uh, and uh, people uh, spend a lot of effort, assuming you have enough observation, to work out uh, focal mechanisms. But you end up with a focal mechanism that, uh, that whose location is, uh, is is very uncertain. So, how to interpret now the the entire cloud and and this this, this set of mechanisms um, uh, into a consistent picture of, of how the rock uh, really broke is is very difficult. And and I have uh, and, and and up to this day still stay away from that because I think the data quality and, and resolution is just not there at the moment. But, but I have hopes um, with, with Vladimir that this, this imaging will, will help us a little bit. And, uh, and what it would do is it wouldn't image the points where the events go off, but it would rather image uh, the fractures that were created. And so you sort of have the possibility of painting sort of a spatial picture of what these created fractures might look like, right? And so it's sort of an independent measurement of what has done uh, uh, to the rock when you uh, treat it hydraulically. And, uh, and I think that it's going to help us uh, or in engineers in understanding uh, heck, what, what happened here, what, what did we do, and, uh, and, uh, and how does the micro-seismic response uh, relate to that? I mean, can, can, can the micro-seismic response be reconciled with the images? Can it be explained in terms of geomechanics? And this, I think, uh, doing this uh, alone from micro-seismic event doubts is, is very hard. What do you both see in the next one to three years for micro-seismic? With, with uh, an oil price where it is right now, and, and maybe, maybe let's say over the next three to five years, somewhere in the, in the 50 to $60 range or something like that, and with, with costs low enough and, and efficiencies high enough, uh, it, uh, I think it'll, it'll be possible to, um, to produce some of those reservoirs and, and, and make money. And so what, what, that, what the implication of that on a, on a global scale is that vast amounts of reserves are now economically accessible. Uh, so but what that means is for oil companies that want to make money in these kind of reservoirs, they have to be extremely efficient. And, and so efficient means, well, keeping your costs down is one aspect, but it can only get you so much. And I think we, we've reached a point uh, because if, you, if operators squeeze prices more, then uh, service companies go out of business. And, and so the next step would be uh, in, in internal efficiencies and I mean, landing the wells in better spots and uh, figuring out, so how can we design our fracture, our frac programs in such a way that we get more production out of it. And I think the, uh, the, the really the only measurement available to, uh, to help along the way uh, is micro seismic monitoring. My hope is, you know, that, that this need um, perhaps will, will, will force the, the, the industry in, uh, in, in developing the, the technology further. And, uh, and uh, velocity models is, I think, is a relatively simple and, uh, and cheap thing to do. Uh, you know, calibrating and developing better velocity models will immediately result in, in better resolution. A similar development we have seen with, uh, with reflection seismic, with seismic. And then I think the next thing would be uh, creating images uh, at, uh, at resolutions, at high resolutions, so that we see what these reservoirs actually look like on smaller scale and then how the fractures 
that are generated, what they look like, and uh, and how they relate to the micro seismic uh, events that, that we record. To add another thought to what uh, Werner just said, uh, and, and it is a positive thought, that micro seismic is in a relatively better position for unconventional than many, many other seismic technologies because they were brought in from conventional reservoirs, which are different, and they have different kind of problems that those I would say conventional technologies, conventional seismic technologies try to address. Uh, whereas micro seismic is perhaps the only one that uh, was created primarily for this task, primarily for monitoring um, those hydraulic stimulations. Uh, and because it is relatively young technology, young te- in, in a sense of, uh, of um, uh, the surveys that just uh, acquired and had the explosive growth in the number of surveys, I think there is a, a good hope, a, a hope, at least I have it, that micro seismic will be at the forefront of uh, this technological geophysical package for unconventional reservoirs. What do each of you hope readers take away from your book? What I hope they'll take away is that to get a good result, you have to make an effort and quite a bit of effort. And if you don't do that, and then yeah, you see you see events or dots on the map, as as we call this in industry jargon, right? But as as I have hinted on before, the interpretability of such a result uh, I think is very limited. And uh, you know, one of the arguments uh, that I had with my with my previous uh, with my boss, my former employer, uh, was was precisely around that topic. He was uh, very uh, surprised to see that. That not more progress has made in 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 the interpretation of of the results that came out of micro seismic monitoring. I'm not surprised. Uh, uh, what what it would take is exactly what uh, uh, sort of the main message of the book is that uh, you need to have a very good velocity model, uh, and 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 to get there requires a sufficient number of observations in the right place and uh, quite a bit of theory in uh, that you need to calibrate these these models, uh, right? But if you if you do so, um, all of a sudden, sort of the the scatter uh, in your event clouds. Uh, reduces and, um, and 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 you may start seeing patterns and, and those patterns may then you may then be able to interpret uh, in a way that uh, that is consistent with with surface atomic images and then consistent with uh, with geomechanics and so for me uh, I hope what the readers take away is if, if that's where you want to get to or where your company wants to get to it yeah, then uh, you need to make an effort and, and, and how you go about it is, is described in the book the governor said as well the main message is about uh, velocity models. I hope that uh, the readers will get excited enough that they begin uh, trying to replicate our equations to code them up, to test them, and likely improve our methodologies, and to learn how to build more precise velocity models than, than those built today. And I believe that if just a few geophysicists employed in micro seismic service companies begin doing that and begin um, getting better results that we are getting, the world is going to get out benefiting the entire industry. Visit seg.org slash new books to buy micro seismic monitoring today. SEG members save 45%. To receive this discount, remember to renew your membership today. 2017 memberships will expire on December 31. 2018 member dues can be renewed online at seg.org slash renew from October 1 to February 28. Please send questions to members at seg.org. Members who renew before December 15 will be automatically entered to win a pre-selected book from the SEG Bookmart. If you enjoy the show, review us on iTunes. Your review helps others find the show. Subscribe to Seismic Sound Off on the podcast app of your choice to receive the latest episodes first. Season 1 of Seismic Sound Off is sponsored by the SEG Wiki, home to hundreds of biographies of key geoscientists, geophysical tutorials, and core content from the science of applied geophysics. Visit wiki.seg.org to learn how you can grow the world's first online geophysics encyclopedia. Original music by Zach Bridges. This episode was produced by Isaac Farley and hosted, edited, and produced by me, Andrew Gary. 
Special thanks to Susan Stam, SCG Books Manager. Thank you for listening. This is Seismic Sound Off, signaling off.